First thing I'd like to do is just to get your name and the correct spelling <coughs> on tape. So if I could do that, that would be great. Yes, my name is uh, Ken Bragg, B-R-A-G-G. -G. Great. And you served in the Navy. Yes, I was in the Navy Reserve for uh, three years and two months and uh, active duty. And I served in the Reserves for about three years after the war and took a couple of three reserve cruises up to Alaska and so on. Now, and, and you grew up in the Olympia, Rochester area. Yes, I, I grew up in, uh, in Rochester on a little tiny farm there. My father worked for the Union Pacific Railroad. Ah, okay. And, uh, The um, so just we'll we'll start real quickly just a little bit kind of a Reader's Digest version. Sorry, a little mm -hmm. background. Yeah. H how you got in the service? You went in before Pearl Harbor or after? Or? No, I was still in high school, and uh, on you know, on uh, December seventh, I remember uh, uh, standing down on Fourth Street here, and they they didn't know when we were going to be attacked uh, on the mainland, and uh, so they took all the troops out of Fort Lewis and ran them all through. Olympia, right? There was no freeway. So it blocked the whole city for about 12 hours while they got all the troops from Fort Lewis out to the beach, out to Aberdeen and so on. So that was, that was my first, uh, you know, first impulse, uh, first reaction to what was happening. But I was in high school. I was a junior, I think, in high school or something. Wow. See, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that they... Yeah, and so then uh, after, after um, I wanted to get in the Navy, and so I... Uh, I tried once, and, and they said I had flat feet. I tried for this V-12 program, which was a, a uh, officer training program in the Navy. And uh, so I went back and went to a podiatrist and got, went through a lot of pain trying to build up a, a naturally congenital arch. And, uh, I, and I went back three months later, and the needs of the service had changed to the point they didn't even look at my feet. <laughs> but I got in the, I got in the Navy, and... Uh, and I was I went to um, uh, Washburn Municipal University for uh, two quick semesters. I'd had two years of college, so they gave me one more year, and then went to Columbia Midshipmen's uh, ninety day wonder midshipmen school. And then I went down to uh, Miami to the anti submarine warfare school. We trained with some uh, uh, Russian officers, incidentally, because we were allies of the Russians in the Atlantic and not in the Pacific. And that, incidentally, I became an assistant communications officer responsible for all the codes on the ship, and that became very important about the Russians because when we went through the Panama Canal, we were commissioned on the East Coast, we had to uh, change all the codes. And I had to, and I had to take a, a 45, you know, <laughs> and go ashore with somebody and we'd, we'd burn them and then get the new ones. Got back aboard ship and as we came up from the the canal up to uh, San Diego, I, I discovered one of the codes was missing. And as a young officer, I was panicked, you know, and I had to go tell the captain, hey, we, if we receive something in this one, we can't, re you know, he, he relaxed me. Anyway, that was <laughs> part of that one. Yeah. And you're still just a kid at this point. You're I'm, uh, I'm, I think I'm 20, yeah, 20 years old. Yeah. But yeah, I was officer of the deck on this ship of 225 people, uh, off through the deck underway under under age 20, and I thought that was pretty young, and yet, as we hold reunions, I found there were 17-year-olds and so on down in the fire in room. They had no idea of what the mission of the ship was or what we were doing, yet they carried out their duties in their, in their narrow context, and I really respected that when I found out, because in the reunions, I would tell them about what we were doing, and they had no idea what we were doing, because it they weren't part of the intelligence operation of the, you know, the management of the ship. I never thought about that. Yeah, they're pretty isolated down there. Yeah, yeah. After the battle that we went through, of course, they came up. Well, what happened? You know, and you, you know, and so they were very eager to see where the damage was and what happened. And so, on. yeah. Now, now you, um, the name of your ship again that you were on? It was the USS Register. It was uh, interestingly, it was named after Lieutenant Commander Register who. I was entombed on the Arizona, and uh, uh, and so that that was, his, in fact, at the reunions, his his wife, or his uh, his wife, yes, would come to our reunions for years. She's now passed away, but uh, but his uh, his sons, he had a son and a daughter, and they still 
come to the museums. Was it a fairly new ship when you got on it, or had it? Oh no, it was it was it was brand new. It, in fact, I was sent to uh, Charleston when it was built, two months ahead of time to uh, be in charge of sort of the pre-commissioning detail, of the, as far as the all the records of the ship was concerned. You see the all of the uh, orders coming down from commands uh, would be addressed to this ship before it was ever commissioned. And so all this stuff was in boxes and I had to help organize it and get it, <laughs> you know, get it ready to <laughs> function. <laughs> and uh, it's a, but uh, when they post the fir first watch, you know, on a, on a commission ship, they say, uh, um, let's see, what do they say? <laughs> Man, they, uh, come to life, come to life. USS Register come to life, and and from then on, 24 hours a day forever, there's somebody on guard or watching or manning, even in port, there's somebody, you know, on this ship. Wow. That's, you know, I, had, I had never thought about that, because everybody I've talked to so far, they talked about some of the rust buckets they were on, and things like yeah. that, got in early in the war. And, and, and well, we went to ship, uh, to a shakedown, and to... Uh, to Bermuda because that's where the uh, uh, Labrador Current and the Gulf Stream kind of come together and so you have some turbulent water there and that's good for the experience of, uh, of, of testing a ship. And so we had, uh, you know, fueling at sea was the most, uh, is, uh, is, is, was one of the top. We broke, we spurt, we uh, went apart too far and, and parted the line at one point with all the oil and stuff and, and it was, you know. <laughs> fuel oil, bunker oil, but anyway, that it was a it was a good uh, good experience, and uh, then we went uh, we went back and uh, went through the canal, and by this time this was in uh, January of forty uh, five, and uh, and by the time we got through shakedown and everything, it was it was into uh, into April, and that was after the invasion of Okinawa had already occurred. And uh, they were losing so many ships that we were just, they were just getting us out as soon as they possibly could. So we were, there were only about nine people on the ship that had ever been to sea before. And it was uh, a great task for the captain to try to train these, this crew. We had right straight for the combat zone. And uh, we had about, uh, we've stopped at Pearl Harbor and at Pearl and, and at Maui. We trained in underwater demolition teams, which is what we were we were designed to carry, and that's why we were uh, made into a, uh, from a destroyer escort, converted to a uh, high-speed high transport so we could ha have these four LCVP boats. So we trained at Maui and then went on directly to Okinawa. And uh, on the way out, the captain would uh, walk around at night and yell, man overboard, starboard side, maybe he wouldn't even say which side it was. And, and see what how the officer of the deck would react. If a, if a man goes over the starboard side, you you you, uh, you turn to the to uh, to the starboard. You turn to the right, so the screws will spin around and, and avoid the man. That was that's the theory of it. And uh, uh, he would pull all kinds of uh, stunts like this, and finally called the officers together in the ward room at night, at one night, and he said, well. I know you think I'm the biggest son of a bitch in the world, but he said, I want you to be alive 10 years from now to call me that. And that was leadership. Oh, that's leadership. Wow. Yeah. Obviously, he had been, he knew oh, where he, he was. Had. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, today, when you say Okinawa, I, yeah. I know Okinawa. I mean, I, 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 mean, I know. Well, that's, I don't know how many miles. It's a special, it's part of Japan, of course. It's a special island south of Japan, the main, uh, the main islands of Honshu and so on. It's uh, maybe uh, 300 miles, 200 miles south of there. It's, uh, and uh, that was the last, uh, last island we thought we had to have before we could invade Japan. Now, as a 20-year-old as a kid, did you know what Okinawa was or what it was? or? Well, I didn't need to know. Uh, I wasn't a navigator. Uh, yeah, I knew where it was. I mean, I know where the charts are. And as officer of the deck, you have to know where the ship is while you're while you're on duty. Um, but uh, uh, the o o Okinawa was, uh, uh, of course, a very important battle. Uh, the 
they were, it was at the time when Japan knew it was losing apparently, or in desperation, they decided to organize the Kamikaze group. And they dumped about 4,000 planes uh, into Okinawa, and, and we destroyed the Japanese Air Force, is what we did. In doing so, the Japanese killed about 5,000 of our sailors and sunk 232 ships and uh, damaged about 150 more that couldn't be repaired. And uh, so it was a major, uh, a major effort. And what uh, I guess I can say what, what happened at Okinawa and on the ship I was on, we, as assistant communications officer, when we got to Okinawa, uh, I went over with the captain to the people that were giving us the orders of what to do, and. Uh, they assigned us picket station 13, which meant that uh, we were out a few miles from Okinawa. They had about 26 of these picket ships, and we would do a figure eight out there. And we were in num Baker 13, as it was called. It was off of Camaretto, where Ernie Pyle was killed, incidentally. And, um, as, and they told us, well, you'll have to stay out there, you'll get hit. And uh, so we... Uh, there were some ships that had to stay there three or four weeks before they got hit, but we were very fortunate. We got hit in <laughs> very fortunate <laughs> in in three in three hours, and uh, there were four planes came out of the uh, out of the sun and uh, the sun was low right at sunset. They came right out of the sun to, to avoid sight detection. We picked them up by radar, and. Uh, they spun around and made a four-pronged attack on us. We knocked down three of them, and one of us, one of them, hit us coming in from the bow. And um, the, uh, the he missed the he missed the bridge, which apparently what he was aimed for. And he missed the main mast, and he hit the king post. We had a little king post in the back to to uh, load cargo into a little hatch in the in the fantail there. He hit that and. Uh, he had a he had a bomb. I saw it and I saw him. But uh, he hit this king post, and the king post kind of diverted the plane for up a little bit, and most of it went over the side. The bomb hit, made a big dent in the deck, but it did not explode, and uh, and it uh, it left about a uh, a wing aboard, and we got all souvenir pieces off of this wing. But uh, there were only I think eight Purple Hearts and no fatalities, so we miraculously escaped. Um, I uh, I felt very fortunate because I my, that was my battle station to uh, to m take charge of six uh, fifty caliber machine guns we had mounted uh, because they weren't designed for the ship but we we got them out of the scrap pile at Pearl to we'd read the battle reports and these kamikazes were aware that we didn't have a five inch gun to make room for these four LCVPs that we had uh, landing craft and so we went. Uh, uh, we we we, uh, we used those, and, and that was my my job. So when the plane hit, uh, of course there were some injured in my my people, and uh, one fellow was these were, the way these were manned at those days. You were strapped in in a fifty caliber machine gun like a like handlebars on a bicycle, you know. And this fellow was just frozen there. I remember walking over and kind of taking his hand off the bar. He was in terror, just just frozen. Then there were some injured, and um, being a boot ensign, and I didn't have the experience to know when to break rules, when not to break rules. So I was very brittle, and the crew didn't like me. The the captain liked me, the crew didn't like me. I knew that because I was I was I wasn't able to uh, to be mature enough to. To do anything but just play it by the book. It's the only thing I could do. And I knew this, and I didn't like it. But I, didn't, I knew that was the role I was in. So I did, I looked around, and instead of saying, let's take care of the people that are injured, I said, reload the guns. And um, because the magazines were empty and we had to get some from below. So you always think of the ship, you always try to get ready for the next attack. And that that changed the whole psychology, is their attitude toward me. It was a, it was so, I knew it immediately that they, they believed in me at that point when I gave that order. So that was, it's really something. What, uh, 
there's a lot of questions that I have because you have a different perspective than a lot of people. Um, in, in reading your article, you talked about uh, being on the fantail. I made some assumptions oh. here. Uh, being on the fantail with the Bibles that were given by the church from here in Olympia. Oh yes, well, um, we weren't big enough to or big enough ship to have a a, a chaplain. And I was a member of the United Churches here. In fact, uh, I was teaching a Sunday school class there. And um, when I went to war, uh, then Governor Langley was a member of that church, and he took over my Sunday school class, which I thought was kind of significant. And um, so when I got to Norfolk, uh, in uh, part of our crew was in, the major part of our crew was was trained in, in Norfolk, and uh, and so I was there for a little while, and while there I went ashore, and we got some, got an organ, a pump, hand pump organ, little tiny thing, and I, I let the United Churches know that we needed some hymnals. So they sent us some little tiny hymnals, just perfect for that purpose, and, uh, and so that's what uh, that was about. And we, uh, I alternated with the supply officer on when I was on watch. Why he he would conduct the service and vice versa. Well, the supply officer didn't charge, didn't really stand watches, but um, I was also responsible for decoding messages, and uh, that was a laborious thing. And uh, I would have to con the supply officer and the doctor into uh, I'd have to coax them into helping me because they weren't they were under. The direction of either the Bureau of Supplies or the or the medical department, and they, in certain respects, they couldn't be ordered to do anything, you know, <laughs> and they 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 were staff rather than line, and uh, so anyway, I got a lot of help with from them and helped me decode these messages. And uh, how did the messages come in? Were they coming? Well, in? there were two kinds of things. One of them were some of them were ciphers, some of them were codes. Uh, but the main thing was uh, was a device they had at that time, which was like a typewriter, and it had wheels in it. And you would have to every month you'd change the wheels, and you'd type the. Uh, at that time, all of the messages came in by what they called Fox Broadcast. We had we had twelve radio operators. Five percent of the crew were radio operators. <clears throat> now there aren't any operators. It comes in automatically. It's uh, all these decoded automatically. But because we didn't know that, uh, since we couldn't receipt for the broadcast because of the the war, the radio operators had to cap capture all the headings, and they would have to be decoded to find out if if the message was addressed to us or something like that. And so, uh, anyway, the the, the little um, place where I had to work was a little in the back of the radio shack was a little tiny door a door and a little tiny room just wide enough for the typewriter and his chair. And it was a perfect place to get seasick because you couldn't see any, any orientation. So I would have to take up some crackers and some water in there to uh, do my job to keep from getting too seasick. And um, uh, and that that's the way you would type this stuff out. And, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So when it came in as code, did it come in as, as sentences or was it? Just no, just five. Uh, five. Each segment is five. Was five characters. Five letters. Find them, you know, five, five letters. And then the, and the, the typewriter with the reels, if you put those letters that, that in. would come in, out in English. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. yeah. Well, the seasickness, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun in a little room on a hot... No, I didn't get seasick. Uh, well, I usually felt squeamish for a couple, three days when we'd leave port, but after that I was all right. But but in that kind of a crap quarter, without any air, it, dry, it was not good. Not good. Well, let's see. Um, when you go on a, on a ship today, if you go visiting these, is there, are there certain smells that still say, that remind you of Navy oh, and the ship? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Things have changed, of course. The, the accommodations are better now, um, but uh, it is still, it's still steel, metal, decks, and, and they get hot when the sun hits them, and, uh, you know. I remember going through the Panama Canal, uh, through Calabra Cut there, where uh, incidentally that's fresh water and uh, Lake Gatun, is it? Lake, uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, the boat rose about, uh, uh, or sunk about five uh, inches in the water. And it 
you know, oh, because over, over it's less buoyant in, in fresh water than salt water. That was kind of interesting. Oh, wow. yeah, but uh, but uh, anyway, they, it was so it was very hot. The, the sun that cut is rock and stuff, and that sun just radiated back. I remember that. Now, what exactly is an ADP? Well, it's an auxiliary personnel transport or something. I, I'm not. I, I guess I don't remember exactly, uh, but it it was a converted destroyer escort, which meant that it was around uh, displaced, uh, what was it, 3,000 tons or something. Um, it was about a little over 300 feet long, and uh, then it was converted by taking off, as I said, the after five-inch gun and putting on four a boat deck with four LCVPs, two on port and starboard, and then uh, it was, uh, and these were designed to uh, launch troops in advance of invasions to uh, do, uh, to reconnoiter and to do sabotage. And uh, we were equipped to carry about 150 of these troops. Our, our complement, uh, wartime complement, was about 225 ship, ships company. And were those usually Marines that, that you would take in, or no? I don't think uh, we just trained. We never, uh, never actually uh, participated in an invasion because we were right at the tail end of the war. But uh, uh, in that, in the way we were designed, we did a lot of we did escort work mainly. And they were. Uh, let's see. What was the question you? Uh, well, um, my mind goes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> I, I was wondering if it was so, Marines. That no, no, no. They weren't. They were. They were. Uh, they would have been Army, I guess. Yeah, Army. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's. I think that was the people that were doing that kind of work. Now you you described the Kamikaze attack. What I'm curious about. Do you remember what was going on in your head? I mean, are you afraid or? or well, the the uh, you don't. You're not afraid in the sense that it stops you from doing your work, because there, it's obvious that you want to get those guns firing, and you want to—that's to save your the, the ship and your own life. So that uh, there's a. But afterwards, I remember, as long as we were still afloat, uh, you know, it was great. So uh, we had some injured, but afterwards, I remember I was off watch. I went down and and uh, went up to the wardrobe to get some food, and uh, my stomach was just in knots. It was just, it actually physically had just kind of turned in a cramp, like a stomach cramp. And it was d due to that, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the terror, the shock of, uh, you know, you could see the, the bullets coming at you, and, uh, and, uh, and you, you can, uh, and then of course when the Kami Kalazi came in, why, that that looked like that was the end, because that's a pretty good sized plane, and you and you're close enough that you said you could see the person. So to me, it sounds like that big object is coming at you fairly fast. And yeah, the, well, I guess they were going two, two, two to three hundred. I don't know, probably two hundred and fifty. I don't know how fast they were going, but they weren't going real fast. Of course, like modern planes, but uh, but there were two. Uh, there were cables attached to this. Uh, this uh, king post, and they were snapped. And my position was right kind of in the middle, midships, and uh, I went out there the next day and I saw the, the marking of the cable in the deck on either side, so apparently those cables came right down beside me, so I just had a miraculous escape to, uh, to uh, you know, I was, uh, was one time when I was, or I, I was not, uh, I was very happy that I didn't get a Purple Heart. Yeah. <laughs> How do you think you, because um, I think about this with all that's happening right now and, mm -hmm. and some of the young kids that we're sending over there and, and mm -hmm. I always wonder, because I was in between wars. I never had to face it. Yeah, yeah. How do you get through it? Well, I don't, I think the tough one was the Vietnam War where the, co the country realized, half the country realized that war shouldn't have been fought. And uh, so they, they didn't get the backing. In the case of uh, World War II, uh, it was so obvious that uh, that we had to, uh, 
we had to fight and win. And so that, there wasn't any question about uh, what had to happen. The, the, uh, of course, the World War II was, uh, went on for six years. We only participated in four of it. And uh, so it was well underway, the war, you know, they had even had a draft, didn't they, I think in 1940 or something. So Roosevelt was trying to uh, move the country in the direction of beyond neutrality, but the country wanted to be isolationist and neutral. And so he did, a, he did quite a good job of, of uh, bringing the Congress along the best he could. And, uh, you know, he had to... He, had to, he gave 50 old destroyers from World War I to, uh, to Great Britain, and uh, we had the Lend-Lease program for Russia. And uh, I think that was a very important thing. They, you don't realize, but there were 20 million Russians died in the World War II, you know, more than any other country. I think we lost about 400,000 all. And uh, so uh, it, it was very important for us to... Uh, to keep the second front viable that the Russians were manning. And uh, I'm not sure, if that hadn't happened, I'm not sure how the ultimate outcome would have been. We might have lost because uh, it was that two front that Hitler couldn't handle. And of course then when Japan attacked, uh, it, it gave us a two front, but uh, yeah, we, our strategy was to finish the war in Europe first and uh, so the we did a lot of things in the Pacific, but we, it wasn't an all-out effort in the Pacific until, until we finished off in, the, in the Europe. Now, of course, there were other things I, I, that I wanted to mention, I think, that were significant in my experience, and that was the uh, episode of the Indianapolis. Uh, well, I'm going to get to that. I've got, I got okay. one more question right. before we get to that, because mm -hmm. I don't want to miss this. Because I don't know the answer to this one, that one of the comments that Adolf suggested is that I ask you about the stolen Jeep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, this came after I left the ship, so all I have are the stories, but the stories are kind of interesting. I, incidentally, uh, I had a brother following me about three years behind me, and, and he was at uh, Whitman going through the same V-12 program anticipating to become a naval officer. Well, unfortunately... He got, uh, when they gave him the shots, it stimulated some kind of a uh, sarcoma. And so he was, uh, he didn't survive. And, uh, uh, but he was still alive while I was out there. And so finally, as soon as Japan surrendered, the Red Cross got me off the, off the ship. So I came back after Japan surrendered in September of 45. The ship came back a few months later. And... Um, so I didn't have the experience of this Jeep. And uh, the Jeep uh, apparently uh, was an Army Jeep, and they were, I don't know exactly how they got a hold of it, but they did. They brought it back to the ship, and they immediately uh, painted it navy blue or gray. And we had a uh, little, we had enough room in our, in our uh, cargo hatch area in the stern to draw, in our king post, we could lift that thing up and, and put it in there and hide it. And um, it was the basis for all the, apparently, all of the parties and the beach parties and things and ashore that they had during while they were occupying Japan for six months or something. And it was a, it was, it was a great story. All the reunions talk about this Jeep, you know, and, and uh, apparently the, uh, we were suspect but apparently they never pinned it on us. Uh, we, uh, we had, uh, when we came down, when we were commissioned, they were commissioning these uh, ships, uh, these APDs, they were called uh, quite frequently. And so somehow or other, they, they allocated us uh, two movie projectors and two ice cream makers. And we got... We were only supposed to have one of each. And the ship behind us didn't have theirs or something. And uh, or anyway, the, somebody kept sending us notes about this. But what it did was we could hold continuous movies without rewinding. That was a very basic thing. So we had other little ships, uh, other smaller ships would come alongside and enjoy our movies. And then we could have more than one flavor of ice cream. 
So, <laughs> and uh, so these are things you don't give up, you know. <laughs> so anyway, those are the, some of the uh, some of the things that happen. Life's got to go on. You know? Yeah, yeah. Now, you started to get to um, you connected to a very famous ship. You have a, a connection to. To the Indianapolis. Yes. Yeah, the Indianapolis uh, is a famous ship, a tragic ship. It was uh, laid down, his keel was laid down in 1932 uh, to uh, at 10,000 tons, which was the limit of the Washington Treaty of uh, 1925 or something, a convention that was held to control armaments. So the designers decided that they would put the maximum amount into um, offensive weapons, and there, it didn't have as much defense protection uh, armor plate as some of these ships that might have had if they'd have been allowed it to be have more tonnage. Uh, it, was, um, it was used during the peacetime by Roosevelt because it had some very elaborate uh, flag officer quarters, apparently. And uh, so even before the war, Roosevelt took several trips on it to get across the Atlantic and uh, so on before airplanes. And um, then um, it went through nine battles of, of World War II, all the island battles from Bougainville all the way up. And uh, uh, even at Okinawa, it was hit by a kamikaze and lost, uh, I think, 17 dead or something. And uh, as a consequence of that, it was sent back to San Francisco for major repair. It was due for a major overhaul anyway. So it went back, got a new crew, and um, about that time, they successfully exploded an atom bomb at uh, in Las Vegas or in uh, New Mexico, Los Alamos. As soon as that was done, they immediately shipped two bombs out to Tinian. Uh, to end the war, hopefully, and it did. So uh, the Indianapolis was nominated to do this. So it started out then from San Francisco and made a speed run with a new crew, uh, or not a completely new crew, but a lot of new people on it. They're about as green as our crew, and we went out. Uh, only nine people have been a, ever been to sea before on the ship I was on. So. So they made a, a record run from uh, San Francisco to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to Tinian, which is just uh, north of Guam, I think. And um, they offloaded the, the, uh, the parts of the atom bomb necessary for it to complete the explosion. And uh, I think I brought a picture here today of the, of the last picture of the Indianapolis to, uh, at that, before it started out. Then it was sent over to the Philippines to join the fleet or do something. And uh, or it, I guess initially it was supposed to go over there and do some target practice with another ship. It never arrived. And it was supposed to be the port director at, uh, at, at uh, Tacloban or at uh, the Philippines knew uh, had a report that it wasn't it, he, he he had knowledge that it was going to arrive. The ship it was supposed to practice with never received the message, so he didn't know it was it was overdue. Port director at that time was supposed to because it was a ship on the line. It was presumed that well the admiral just diverted it somewhere, so he didn't feel any responsibility for reporting it missing after two days. We at the and about the time it um, it left Guam for the Philippines, we left Phil the Philippines, escorting a couple of aircraft carriers over to to Guam or to Tinian. And so, about uh, on uh, about just after midnight on July thirtieth, which would be July twenty ninth here because of the dateline, uh, it was. Uh, it was torpedoed and uh, sunk in 12 minutes. Uh, all communication was lost. They couldn't uh, get a message out, apparently. And 
about 800 of the crew, of 1,100, uh, they think, got off in the water safely. And um, at about that same time, we were, we were heading the opposite direction. Our ship was about 150 miles away, so we were within about six or seven hours of the tragedy. And, of course, that is the, that's the thing that we deeply regret because we didn't know. You know, we could have saved 500 people who perished in the four days before it was known that they were there. And so we continued on over to, uh, to Guam. We headed back again over the same water and got the message to go and search. So we, we then went out with about 600 ships. And uh, we, um, I remember the first fellow that we picked up was in very good condition, relatively. He had, he had clothing. He had a pea, he had a pea jacket on, and he had a, a sailor's hat on. So he was shielded a little bit from the sun, and, and he was on a little cork net uh, thing. And so, he insisted on climbing the Jacob's ladder. I mean, he he wasn't. Everybody else was unable to climb aboard. He ins he had the energy, and he and then then he got aboard, and he saluted the quarter deck. And I'm telling you, everybody around there was in, that watched that was in tears. It was a very moving thing. And it was at that point that um, we found out who was, uh, you know, it was the Indianapolis that was sunk. We continued. We 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 were kind of on the outskirts of the search area, and so we picked up stragglers over a period of, of hours, about twelve altogether. And then they because. When we first got the message, the captain had asked to refuel. He had, we were low on fuel. And we knew something big was going on because uh, they said, no, uh, go immediately. But, so we, uh, because we even, we had to go then to, to get some fuel. So we took on survivors from other ships. And so we took about 37 into uh, Peleliu, about 300 miles south. And uh, they were all alive when we uh, put them ashore there. And then we returned to the search area, and all we found was empty life rafts and things. We didn't find anybody, any more survivors. Um, the, um, in 1995, I was invited to, uh, to go to Indianapolis. Oh, Indiana. Let me interrupt oh, you for yeah. one second. Mm -hmm. How many days? Had it been sunk before you? Four days. Four days that, man, those people survived in the, wow. Well, 316 survived out of about 800. 500 perished during those four days because either, either from uh, uh, shark attacks, uh, all, that's been played up a lot. I, I don't think that, I think most of them died from what I've talked to them, died of exposure and uh, you know, rather than the sharks, but the sharks did take some. And one of the, we picked up an ensign whose whose leg was gashed, uh, who, who was alive, but he he, uh, he had a gash from a from a shark bite. And uh, all of these people had to be, uh, since we were equipped to carry these underwater demolition teams, we had uh, a lot of bunks along the side and uh, inside there along the passageway and. So we had facilities, and we had a doctor because we were carrying these troops, or we were equipped to carry them. And so we were uh, able to feed them uh, intravenously and restore their body chemistry, which was very disrupted. And they they wouldn't have lasted in much longer. There's a, there's one survivor still living in the state of Washington, Jean Morgan in Seattle. Uh, they had a. Uh, dinner the other night at, uh, at St. Martin's for the veterans, yes. and, uh, and he was down at our table. And, really? And, uh, and we, had, uh, we he, had people from the Hollandia, which... Uh, did he have a jacket on with... Uh, the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to get... Uh, I, said I was out there. I wanted to get well, a hold of him because... Well, they, they, I tried to get the people to recognize him, but they said, oh, there's so many heroes here that we can't do it, so they wouldn't do it. I thought that's what the dinner was for. But well, they wouldn't do it. I tried, but I couldn't make it. And, Gene and then Morgan. the Olympian didn't cover it either. No, wasn't that a shame? Well, I don't know why it was. I'm surprised. So anyway, um, 
Yeah, Gene is, um, I don't know, do you do this around the whole state of Washington? Yes. Yeah, well, you may want to talk to him. I, I've got his address here. Oh, good. Um, so the, uh, the problem, there was a political problem associated with this thinking, and that was that the parents of the loved ones of these 500 would start asking their congressmen, you know, what happened here. And uh, so the Navy felt compelled to do something, and uh, they court-martialed Captain McVeigh, which is the first captain, only captain that's ever been court-martialed for losing a ship in battle. And uh, so then the, but the crew supported McVeigh. So they spent the next 50 years trying to get this thing overthrown, and about 56 years later, they finally have done it. Now it's been squashed to put, put aside. Uh, in 1995, they dedicated a memorial to the Indianapolis at Indianapolis, Indiana. It's a beautiful memorial. And uh, they, uh, at the base of that memorial, they took a piece of the Arizona and, uh, and put it under the memorial. And, this, and the, the concept was that the Arizona was the first ship sunk and the Arizona and the Indianapolis was the last ship sunk in World War II, and uh, so I thought that was rather uh, appropriate. The uh, there were about over about 110 survivors came to that were still alive and came to that ceremony in 1995. Um, we were very honored to have been honored by by being invited because we. We get a lot of credit for saving their lives, of course, and uh, by the survivors. Uh, but we're not the heroes; they are. But but there is a bonding there between the people. Who, you do feel very close to those people. If you if you say somebody, that's a big ocean out there, and uh, particularly after they were in the water for four days. The uh, I went to a luncheon here several months ago, I guess it was last May, in which the new publisher, Mr. Ritter of the Olympian, spoke to the Chamber of Commerce. And after the luncheon, I introduced myself, and I'm, uh, I'm on the board of trustees of the Timberland Library, yeah. and uh, I wanted to contact him and, and uh, make arrangements to come in and tell him some of the issues that I think uh, face the library. And while I was talking with him, he looked at my name tag and he says, uh, Ken Bragg. And I said, well, what's that about? He said, I saw your name in that, in that book, Abandoned Ship on the Indianapolis from Olympia, Washington. And uh, he said, I want to, he said, and so he immediately then called me the next day. And we, we, then we talked about this and also the library. But uh, as a reason, and then he published this publicity in the paper about uh, about uh, my, the role of uh, being saving some of the survivors and so on, and as a result of that publicity, uh, I got phone calls uh, from several people. Uh, somebody was a nurse on a, on a hospital ship that took care of the survivors. Somebody had a good friend who taught school for years with a survivor that is now deceased in Eastern Washington. There were four people from the Hollandia. The Hollandia was an aircraft carrier that took the survivors back to the States after they got well enough to do so. And uh, uh, it, and I couldn't figure out, well, why would there be four, four crewmen from the, from the Hollandia? Maybe there was a crew of 800 on this small aircraft carrier. Uh, four from Olympia is quite a few. It turned out that the Hollandia was decommissioned in Olympia. And they married, they got off the ship, and uh, and uh, and some of them uh, found some some uh, wives here and uh, married some people here, women here in uh, Olympia. And uh, so I decided to have a have a get together. So I invited uh, to my house uh, Jean Morgan, the survivor, and then all these other people. So we had a special party at our house. It, it's uh, if you weren't part of that, it would be hard to, uh, you know, you'd be kind of wondering what it was. But 
people were so, they were talking about everything. I mean, it was a great party to do a reunion of all these people after all those years. And that was, uh, but uh, I never knew that Hollandia was, uh, was decommissioned here in Olympia. Apparently they were decommissioning ships in Seattle and Tacoma, and, they, and, they, and some of them, they didn't have room everywhere, so they, they came clear, clear down here to Olympia. So that was kind of an interesting little sideline to it. Have you ever had, because you, you talked about it in this reunion you had and the, and the feeling you had of the, the gentleman getting on the scoop. Since World War II, have you ever had uh, a bond like you've had with these people? I mean, is that a one-time experience in your life? or, or the things well, you, you mean, have I had bonds with other people this, is, well, this besides the, war? I don't they, understand yeah, the question. Compared to, to the, the I, oh. when I talk to the vets, their lives are this big, and World War II was this long in that time continuum. But yet, I talk to a lot of them, and there's this amazing bond that, that, that has developed. And I've always wondered if they found that somewhere else, or if that is a unique. Oh, I think it is unique. Yes, I've I've had a very broad professional and personal experience in my life. Otherwise, and uh, uh, you know, I could talk a long time about that. Uh, but but it wouldn't uh, it it wouldn't make me it wouldn't make me choke up emotionally as I have here uh, very honestly I couldn't pre you know I, uh, that isn't put on feelings it was just they just come out so it so it is a real bond there's no question about that um, particularly I think on a small ship uh, and particularly on a ship. You really, you're really all close together on a ship, and uh, uh, you. I know that there. I went over to the uh, to see the Missouri one time when it was. Uh, they were having a reunion of the shipmates of the Missouri, and there were 600 of them on the dock there watching the ship, and I talked to some of them, and it turned out that that ship had been commissioned three times. And so it had different crews over a 20, 30 year period, or maybe more. And one fellow was saying, boy, it doesn't look the same as it did. And of course, they keep changing the, the armament on it and the kind of, of, uh, of uh, devices they use for modern warfare. And so it doesn't look quite the same. And so the point is, and so they didn't know one another. And so there isn't quite that same bonding. And uh, so I, I, I don't think there is. Um, but people do go to hold, you know, like the Rainbow Division or something, the whole division will have a reunion, but it, unless it's right that group that's in that platoon or that company, uh, you know, that there there's, there there's a bonding, I'm sure. It has to be a smaller group than a huge thing, I think. But... Uh, then, then I think you have to have some experiences, like, uh, like we had the, the experience of the of the Kamikaze attack, and we had the, the picking up the survivors in Indianapolis. I think those are. Those, uh, those are very bonding things because. Uh, it brings. Uh, it is it is it's an experience that you don't, experience just as an individual. There are other individuals experiencing it, and you're in a group. So uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's true. I think uh, I think there, there's a pride in uh, in serving. Um, that uh, that the military training I think gives you. Uh, you know, you, I was I I was very proud to be in the Navy. I was proud to be a, an ensign. An officer, I, I'm very proud of that, and uh, that uh, it, it helps people carry out their duties and responsibilities uh, in a in a good fashion. To have that kind of morale. How do you think the war? This is kind of a hard one. How do you think it changed your life? That experience. Well, one thing I was going to—I was taking pre-law courses, and I was going to be an attorney. And when I got back, I was—I uh, uh, got married at the end of the war. I was still in the Navy for another year to get enough points to get out, and uh, 
uh, so by the time I got back to school, I was uh, had a wife and child to support. So uh, uh, I did have a good career, and I did get a master's degree, but I did not get uh, become an attorney. I don't know if that affected me very much. Um, the um, and of course, I lost a brother, which was uh, very, he was very close to me, uh, and uh, those are permanent scars that you never get over. Um, the um, but I I, uh, I don't know uh, what it would have been like without a war. I guess it would be nice to not have the war. I agree with that. I don't think it took the war to give me a good life afterwards, but uh, it would have been different, I suppose. Was your your now wife, was she your sweetheart while you were in the service, or did you meet her? No, no, she was, uh, I met her before the, uh, before the war, we were, we were to, she lived, grew up in Seattle, and uh, I was quite active in the, in the church, and she was active in the church. Uh, and she was, in fact, president of some youth organization in the church, and we would meet at conferences while we were in high school. And then um, and she went down to Pacific University for a year, and uh, after going a year at St. Martin's, I went down to Pacific University in Oregon, and so we, um, we were together down there. And uh, uh, then uh, after, after I got in the Navy and I was coming through after the shakedown cruise, went through the canal and stopped a few days in San Diego. I got leave for three days and got an army plane and came up to Seattle and or up to Olympia. And she came down from Seattle and uh, and went down to Talbots, Talbots, Talcott's, Talcott's jeweler, and uh, and got a ring. And I remember that. No, it wasn't. You know, it was, instead of thousands of dollars, it was in the few hundred dollars at those days and. Uh, and I, and I had a little payment book. I remember seeing this payment book. I made the payments. So that was, uh, that was uh, I'm sure that was brought on by the, the, the timing. Was had something to do with the fact I happened to be have three days before I went out to maybe get killed or not. And uh, so, so I was, uh, you know. Yeah. Did you get correspondence from her while you were on the ship? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I, letters could catch up with you then? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, we, oh, yes. We, uh, that the mail the mail deliveries were good, um, and uh, I remember writing a letter to uh, to my parents after after I escaped at Okinawa. For the first time, I I thought, well, my God, maybe I won't come back from this thing. So I started. I wrote them really in a letter. What would be a, a will almost? It was a horrible thing to do to your parents. Now to think about it, you know. And so I wrote them and. Told him a few things what I would like to have happen in case I didn't get back. <laughs> what a terrible thing to do to them, you know. That that was I shouldn't have done that, but I didn't. You know. And <laughs> now that I think about it, that was that wasn't fair. I didn't need to do that. Well, what type of things did you want to put in order? I mean, do you remember what you told them? Uh, no, I can't even remember now. But I I I just remember giving obviously giving them the feeling that. Uh, that uh, I couldn't tell them exactly what happened, but because of security. But I, I, uh, I remember telling them that, that uh, you know, we had an experience where it was, I just escaped and so on and so forth. Did you get a reply from them? I can't remember that. Don't ever said, send us one of those letters. No, <laughs> no, no, no. They would never do that either. But no, no, it was. But uh, they were under extreme stress. You see, they were. They were sitting there waiting to try to, to get me back to see my brother, their son, before he passed away. And he did pass away within a week after I got back. Well, so you got back, though. Yeah, I got back and him. got to see him in his, on his deathbed, you might say. And so, well, it was. So I wouldn't have gotten back. I hadn't been for my uncle. My, mother, my father's brother was a colonel in the Army, and he had gotten back from New Guinea, and he was in uh, Sheffield Barracks in Hawaii. And so I flew from, and uh, I flew from the Philippines to Hawaii, not nonstop. It was, you know, no, no jets in those days. So Johnson Island and Midway Island, and 
various things. So anyway, uh, I went over to see him, and they were going to put me on an aircraft carrier. It would take about a week to get over there. And he uh, used his influence as a colonel. He got a hold of a captain, uh, which is the same rank in the Navy, and, and they got me on an airplane. The, the Army Transport Service, I think it was called, ATS. And I uh, got an airplane, got, got into Fairfax uh, base in San Francisco, and then caught another plane up to, up to Olympia or Seattle or something. So uh, that was a big help, a big help in that case. Yeah. The, um, well, we have, uh, it's interesting, you made one statement earlier mm -hmm. that, that when you were young in the service, you didn't know when you could break the rules. Oh, yeah. So I assume yeah. there became a point where you learned that the rules are important, but also survival, and you have to... Well, you have to give your people a chance to know that... Uh, you understand their problems, and uh, and, uh, and and that whatever decisions you have to make is as a command decision. Why it, you are taking into account their feelings and you know what they need. I wasn't able to give them that feeling. I don't think. I just you know, this is the rule. That's the way it is. And, um, so. Uh, You know, I don't know what I would have done if uh, I never had to have this happen, but suppose I'd been walking around the ship at night or something and I found the gun crew asleep or something. I probably would have reported them rather than just shake them and wake them up. You know, yeah. that kind of thing. When a, when a more mature person would, or, I, or he would have somebody else shake them so that you didn't know what happened. Yeah. So you could still... Follow but, the but, rules, but, but, but. but that's a pretty that's a pretty extreme case. Probably if the gun crew is asleep, you you really you jeopardizing the whole uh, the whole ship. So uh, or the lookout lookout that'd be a better example. Uh, but on minor things, that that's a major thing. Minor thing. But, Do you remember any of the meals? Do you have a favorite Navy meal and a least favorite Navy meal? Well, all the, the same. Well, all the, uh, the, 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 well, the, the food was, was in the cooking. You see, the, the raw products was pretty good. We, we got the best of everything. The civilians at home didn't get as good. Um, but I remember this one Thanksgiving or something, um, or at least a turkey. Maybe it wasn't Thanksgiving, but a turkey. And we had it had a tag on it. In the frozen, see, it had a tag 1928, and I, I never forgot that somehow they are, they, they had managed to keep this thing frozen since 1928. And, and, <laughs> but uh, I'm glad that I, uh, you know, wasn't in the army where the we had the foxhole and the sea rations. They have a lot better sea rations today than they did then. But um, it's it's. Puzzling. The people in the army didn't like to be on a ship, and they would just—they would just love to get off and get the security of a of a foxhole. They didn't like to be on a ship, and uh, whereas the navy people were just the opposite, of course. And, and, uh, get me out in the water. Huh? Well, if you if you get sunk, you you have a problem. But if you don't get sunk, sink. If you don't sink, by then your life goes on. Just. You, you know your your bunk is still there, and it's uh, your food is still there, and so you know. But uh, it's a harder life, I think, in the army, unless you get sunk. Yeah. And then two two last questions. Mm -hmm. I when I see the American flag go by, and I mean I've always mm -hmm. had respect for the flag, man. Mm -hmm. you know. But after working on this project and what's happened back east, there's, I mean I. I, when I see a parade, I'm like, tears are coming to my eyes. Mm -hmm. When I went down the Veterans Day's parade, mm -hmm. see these young. What do you feel when you see the flag, and what does it mean to you that it might not mean to me? Well, I have two feelings about this. Um, I, I really honor the flag, 
and I don't know exactly why I want it. It isn't. It's a, it's a. I guess it's because of I. I participated in the defense of the flag, and uh, and I, but I, I have a degree in public and international relations, and I'm very much aware of. The world out there, and I'm very concerned about solving problems with just military power, and so I. Um, I think that's a big problem that Israel has faced. It, it, it seems to only have one way of solving a problem that's superior military power, and I don't think that's going to work in the long run for them. I'm sure it won't. Uh, on, the, on the terrorism thing, I, I feel that we need to ask ourselves, are, is there any relationship between terrorism and our policies? Uh, in a very broad sense, about uh, just on the matter of how much food, how food is distributed in the world, how unevenly it's distributed, or how unevenly education is distributed. Um, in a in a narrower view, would be the the uh, the lack of a of a level playing field in the Israeli Palestinian problem. Of course, I'm I'm. I'm biased there because I spent a year as the financial advisor to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan once and took my family over to Jordan. And in fact, uh, and, and so I, uh, uh, terrorism is much broader than just that issue, but even in that issue, uh, I feel that, uh, that we've supported uh, Israel far too much without her changing her positions. Um, and uh, and I think it's hurting Israel, but it's hurting us, also. And I think that may come home this time. That, that uh, there is another world out there, and we, uh, the radicals who caused this problem for us on September 11th, are uh, they're vying for those people out there too and they're going to go either way and and we're very handicapped in doing a lot about that because our public in general is is interested in flag waving but is not interested in looking at why and until that happens uh, I think we're very vulnerable we can never this thing we're doing now is, is just a little piece of the puzzle. And, and if they, they've got cells in 60 countries, then we have to, we've got to f search real deeply, and the answer is not militarism, in my judgment. So I'm patriotic, very patriotic, but I see the limits of, of militarism. And I think with the world coming together in communication and transportation, it's doing two things. The poor people now know how the rich live. That's one thing it does. And, it, and the other thing it does, it, you know, through international trade and so on, it brings the whole, all the economies together. So we, we can't, um, we have to understand that our, our life and welfare belongs with other people on this planet to the extent that we've got to find out how to use the United Nations, even as, even as frustrating as it is to use it, that's what the world is. And it is a communication device to communicate with them. Uh, the president now is doing something about that, I think. Uh, he seems to be saying, well, I'll take care of the militarism, but then there's another role to be played later for the United Nations. Uh, but I hope the American people will understand that. But, uh, so uh, I don't know if that helps under explain. But I'm not just a simple flag waver. I'm. I feel very deeply about some of these basic issues. It's a, com it's a complex, a lot more complex issue than some want to make it. I mean, it's a complex world out there. Yeah. yeah. You kind of answered my my Here's second. A, I will say though. The, the positive thing is that there's an awful lot of education now taking place. The people are now realize there are a million, there are a billion and a half or more or less uh, 
Muslims in the world, you know, for example, and that they live various places from Indonesia to some, you know. And that, and that Osama bin Laden really doesn't represent Muslims. I mean, he, he is a yeah. different, totally different. Yeah, and I think that, that that is one of the positive things that happened is that the education and the opening of the eyes to uh, some of the things you talked yeah. about, the global yeah. world. It's, yeah, yeah. Did, because uh, um, you kind of answered my second question, and so this, uh, I'm going to change my last question a little bit, um, because I'm making an assumption that you were involved in the church when you were young, I assume you're still involved in the church now. Not, not so much. I, oh, is that right? I, uh, um, I was just wondering. It isn't, it, it, it's, it's just that I, uh, I'm involved in a lot of different activities, uh, organizations and things, and uh, I'm. Uh, I, I think that I. I, uh, I probably need to. Need the church to, uh, you know, to bury me someday, uh, but I don't. I don't. Um, I feel very comfortable in dealing with, the society and, and my fellow man, and. Uh, I don't. Um, I don't. I'm not here. I'm not non-religious. I just uh, um, I haven't attended for a while, but uh, I do sometimes. I <clears throat> one little church I go to is is where I grew up in Rochester, and there's a little Methodist church down there, and we go down there oh about every two months, and because it's the one place I can go where the culture is the same as my childhood culture. It's. Uh, it hasn't changed a lot. There's a bedroom communities coming in and so on, but still is the, the core. When I first went down there about eight, nine years ago when I moved here, uh, I found people that, uh, they were very elderly, and I guess they've passed on now, but they they knew my parents, and they, they knew me, and, you know, when I lived there. Yeah. Huh. Well, so. well the, the reason I, I, I asked that was because I was wondering if, being in a war caused uh, any religious conflict for you? If, if that was a, something you had to, to struggle with? You mean like a pacifist? Well, no, uh, no, no, no. You're, just in, I mean, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. Oh, well, um, I, um, I always interpret that to mean thou shalt not kill uh, uh, unless your wife is being raped. I mean, you, you shouldn't reach out and initiate killing. But uh, self defense is. Yeah, I think. Uh, I just want to because, yeah, because I, I don't think the Pope has ruled that out yet, and I certainly listen to Billy Graham. He doesn't rule it out. I just a friend of mine just sent me a great one from Billy Graham that, he, and I can't even remember what was in it now that I got yesterday on the internet, but. Well, he conducted a service at the National Cathedral just after the bombing in the, in the trade centers. And uh, he had to be helped up there, but boy, when he finally got going, it was, he's, he's still pretty good. Yeah, he's a, uh, I think he's such a well-balanced, he's a dynamic and, and mm -hmm. charismatic person, but, but so well-balanced, it seems. Yeah. Human. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he is. But, uh, <clears throat> Well, I want to thank you for this opportunity to uh, to uh, to sit here and kind of rem reminisce a little bit. I um, the as I say, there, there were about fifty million people died in World War Two, and uh, uh, not very relatively few from the United States. Um, so that um, we really haven't, except for the Trade Center thing, we haven't had a, in Pearl Harbor, we haven't had a real, since since the capital was burned in 1812, we haven't had a, uh, we haven't experienced uh, what most countries have experienced. And um, I don't know what that means, but it must give us a little different uh, viewpoint. Now we've found out how to, go to war without casualties, that's, um, 
that's a little bit, I don't want to say casualties, but I, I hate to see us think that that war has become that um, uh, clean, yeah. sanitized. It's Again, we, we, we lose a little perspective in the fact that, yes, it's a very controlled casualties and all that, but yet what they're facing over there and what we're facing over here is totally different. We don't have to worry about jets flying over or bombs, whether they're coming for us or <laughs> coming for the Taliban out there, for the people that wake up every morning and face that fear. I was trying to account for why, Brit and why Britain just grabbed us so, embraced us so much after September 11th. I think it was because of the bombing of London during World War II, I think. I think they immediately uh, connected. Of course, it's been a long time ago, but still, um, the, uh, they experienced something there that in the Churchill's, Churchillian speeches there were just uh, magnificent, you know. Um, Bush has been given credit now for that kind of leadership, but uh, his words aren't quite the same. And so, if he had the same problem as Churchill, I, I hope he could rise to that because that, there's some, some great words that Churchill used to keep the morale up under very dismal conditions. But we haven't faced that. He sure grew up fast. What's that? George G.W. sure, this has aged him fairly quickly. Yeah, he looks a little differently, yeah. He looks more like his dad. Uh, yeah. If you look at his dad's really day in office yeah. versus yeah. when yeah. you look at him a year ago, I'd like to see side-by-side -side pictures, but... Uh. Well, the thing is that he's he's very good at, uh, at uh, cheering us on and, and giving us a feeling of, uh, this is serious, folks, and we're going to have to do something about this. Um, but the... The problem we have is, and he's expressed it, which is, this is only the beginning. So he has got, well, he's done something at the beginning here that is very popular. Uh, whether anybody or he in particular can, 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 uh, can devise all the policies and explain it to the American people, how the complexity of which which we're going to have to, uh, and, and the risk we're going to have to take to uh, to solve this problem. It's, uh, yeah. So we're going to, we're going to have to, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I think the American people, if they had a, if this would shock them the way World War II did, it, maybe it would make everybody search deeply for some answers, but we we're going to, we have a responsibility for for searching within ourselves how to deal with this problem, not just rely on the president. Um, and it, and it's, it's going to be very hard for the president to, to lead unless unless we do do that. Yeah. And I certainly think that we have to we have to listen to the so-called peaceniks, uh, which is terrible to have us fight for freedom and then and then and then have us close the door on freedom I'm it's very I'm very disturbed with people that are that are upset with people who exercise their freedom of speech wow As I did I somebody some French philosopher I forgot which one it was but he said I disagree with what you say but I'll defend it to death you're right to say it always stuck with me. I've just been interviewing the macaw and, and dealing with the whaling issue. Mm -hmm. And the, the gentleman was telling me about the protesters and, and what they were doing and all that. And he said, but you know what? He said, I understand that they were exercising their right to freedom of speech mm -hmm. as I was exercising my right to freedom of speech, that we both were doing yeah. exactly the same thing. Yeah, you, it, uh, yeah, you can criticize the... Uh, uh, you have a right to criticize the people who criticize, uh, but uh, 
But when it comes to the point where the, where it starts to influence public policy on, on destroying the avenues of expression, uh, then it's get pretty dangerous. We're very close to that right now. It's, uh, it's yes, <laughs> we're right on the brink. Yeah. yeah.